We've got some breaking news on the eviction moratorium. Diana Olick's got the details. Diana. Hi, Melissa. Yeah, we're just getting on a Treasury call where they're announcing that they're extending the federal eviction moratorium that expired on July 24th through the end of this year. But it's interesting how they're able to do this through an executive order. They're actually using an order from the CDC, which is saying that it is no longer healthy to evict anyone from a residential property. And under the CDC rule, which was just posted, it says, under this order, a landlord, owner of a residential property or other person with a legal right to pursue eviction or pos or possessory action should not evict any covered person from any residential property in any jurisdiction in which this order applies during the effective period of the order. Now, we do know that 30 states do not have any more eviction protections right now. Most of them have all expired. Other states have some, New York, California, et cetera. We've been reporting that today. But this essentially puts the eviction extension on that moratorium through the end of the year. We're still getting details on this through Treasury. It does appear that it would cover a lot, most of if not all properties, and they're saying that they're using money from uh, from HUD in order to help landlords to get through this in order, because obviously landlords have to pay their expenses on these properties, even if they're not getting rent. They are talking on the call now about what type of uh, renter who possibly is behind on rent would be covered, but it appears under this CDC order that it is wide ranging and that most people would be covered at least through the end of this year on the eviction moratorium. We'll get more details to you as they become available. Diana, you may not know this at this point with, with the details so fluid, but would the help to help landlords be commensurate with the help that would keep renters in place and not evicted? And I'm just wondering, because if, if instead of a, a wave of evictions that we've staved off, if we're going to see a wave of foreclosures uh, on properties because landlords can't make those payments. Right. Well, so if you're a single family landlord, which is about 40 percent of the market, you do have the option to go into the mortgage bailout, which is, of course, the forbearance program, which gives you forbearance for up to a year on your property. And under that program, people in those properties cannot be evicted. And FHFA has already put an extension on that for foreclosures on those properties. So that would help the single family rentals. Then you start to look at the multifamily. The big REITs, the names we talk about that could be affected, they have not seen the high rate of tenants not paying that others have. In fact, their payments are pretty high, still around 92 and a half percent of all of the large national multifamily are getting that they're paying rent. And that's not that much lower than a year ago. It's the sort of two to six unit smaller buildings where you have tenants there who are much more lower income, in fact, the lowest income of the renter scale, who are really being hit hard by that. The smaller buildings, they are seeing the high rates of rental delinquencies, and they're the ones who are going to need help from the government about what to do about those buildings as they go into mortgage delinquency on their own properties. Right. Uh, so complicated. Diana, thank you. Diana Olick with all the details here. Um, as we look out, Dan, I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of the pain. It, it just it, We're protecting one class but inflicting pain on another, and in the end, it's all pain on the economy. Yeah, I think you asked a great um, question, Mel, and it really is. We do have to balance a lot of this out. Obviously, we need to, you know, there's been trillions of dollars thrown at the economic effects of this pandemic, and it does need to be equalized. We need to protect our vote most vulnerable citizens. And, and you know what? The CDC angle on that is fine. But you also need to protect those people who, um, you, you know, have the, have the loans on, on those businesses. And uh, they face foreclosure, too. So, you know, listen, I, I think that we're going to need to see some more conversation on fiscal stimulus because that's how this economic recovery gets derailed. You use the expression numerous times this spring. It's kind of a bridge to a vaccine. We don't have any visibility on that. So we're going to continue to need to kind of pump the fiscal uh, uh, you know, pumps here to keep things going. It's it's a, a bridge that's getting longer by the day. I mean, to think that yeah. this moratorium goes through the end of the year and that the perception is that it's needed till the end of the year. And yet this is a day where the S&P and the Nasdaq set new new highs guy. Copper hit a two year high MSCI World Index all time high. I mean, it's just amazing sort of the dichotomy between what the markets are telegraphing and what the economy is. Yeah, we've talked about that for a while, mm -hmm. and that chasm continues to grow. To your point, you know, it's interesting as I'm listening to Diana talking, what struck me was, you know, what does this mean for banks, if anything? Mm. But, you know, what I'll say, and I think Dan would probably agree with this, you know, the banks have not, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but they have not traded well. I mean, look at Wells Fargo, for example, closed around 24. I think the March low was 22. And I got to tell you, with news like this, that March low becomes closer and closer in the crosshairs. So, there are reasons to own banks. However, 
When you hear things like this, you have to wonder what the loan loss provisions are going to look like going forward. And I don't think it paints a particularly rosy picture, in my opinion. All right. Let's